All right, so now we're going to talk about network security. So we've, uh, we've talked for a while, we've kind of built up a good background of we looked at policies and mechanisms and we looked at uh, authentication and authorization and crypto. And now we're going to get a little bit more technical and kind of go into the various types of technologies and things that we use and what are the security problems, issues, things that we should be considering there. Um, so uh, we're going to start off with, with networking and network security. Uh, this, um, and we will then go from there depending on how much time allows. So to go over this, we're going to have to go over the basics of networking. So this is kind of a, um, since we're moving down to a more technical level, if we don't know, if you don't know how the network actually technically works and how packets move around and how things get routed, then you can't talk about the security of those protocols or how, what types of attacks are actually available uh, given different scenarios. So we're going to go over essentially a primer of the networking stack. Um, cool. Any questions? All right. How many people have already have net taken networking? Okay. So. So we're going to get class three next semester. It's awesome. Is she good? <coughs> hey. Well, it's not. It's not a conversation about that. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and I guess I should also mention, so this, so my, my grad level software security course, we go over network insecurity, binary insecurity, and web insecurity. So I've taken some content from there and we're going at a very high level of, well not a very high level, but a higher level. So we're not gonna go as in depth as we would, but uh, some you know, these, these ideas and concepts of how network work, how packets move around are important. So. Uh, IP, so IP stands for Internet, Port Internet Protocol, um, and the idea was the, the idea behind the Internet is what? What does the Internet mean? Computers are hooked together. Yeah, but can you connect computers together and not have an Internet? You have a what? Internet. An intranet, which means what? Within. So what's the difference between the two? Distance. 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 Can you have an intra as well? I, don't I mean, know. I guess you can have a WAN that spans a large chunk, but then technically it's, I mean, internet is spanning the globe, I guess. But why? Is it the <laughs> physical distance that actually makes it an internet? Yeah. Yeah, so I think about it more in those terms or even in the organizational term, organizational terms, right? So a network, if you think about the ASU network, we are physically that physically spread out. I mean, ASU has five different campuses in Arizona. That whole system would be considered the ASU network. And that would be, I would consider an intranet because that is literally, I mean, ASU controls everything. So if they want to change how things work, if they want to change from, I don't know, whatever, they could change any part of this stack, and it doesn't matter because as long as they control that entire network. So it's a, to me, it's about really organizational control. The idea is when an ASU wants to send a data packet to Google or Amazon or a completely different network, right? Both organizations need to agree on what protocols, what that means, how data gets from one point to the other to make sure they're talking the same language. So that's really what, I mean, the, the genius really of the internet is that you have this interconnected organizations and different networks. So nobody actually cares how you internally route and deal with traffic as long as externally you speak the same protocols and languages that everyone else does. And so the standard that we have uh, landed on is broadly the, the internet protocol suite. It's also shorthand TCP IP. Uh, it's usually the way we think about it because these are the main protocols. Um, and the idea is, uh, this is based on the idea of abstraction and encapsulation. So 
at different layers of the protocols do different things and are in charge of different things, and at various layers, they don't need to know the details of everything below them, which would be abstraction, right? We don't care. Um, when I'm sending a packet from here to Google, that requires different information than sending a packet from this laptop to the wireless router that I'm connected to, right? That has to do with all crazy Wi-Fi and um, whatever 802.11 spec I'm using. And then you think about how does it physically get there? What are the modulations of the radio frequency? What channel is it on? All that stuff. But my computer actually shouldn't care about any of that because the data could be transmitted over the wire, right? If I'm plugged in on Ethernet. Um, so, but the TCP IP, the higher level layers, actually work the same no matter what physical layer you're working in. Um, and so we think about this, we have link layer protocols, which I think of as one machine talking to another machine or uh, talking to another node. Internet protocols that actually get us to talk between networks and transport protocols that can actually finally transmit data. So once you can talk from one point to the other, you actually want to transmit some data. And finally, application protocols that define, well, now you have a mechanism to talk between two nodes. What do you want to say? Right? What language do you want to talk? Because um, if you're, I don't know, I guess using a human analogy, if you call somebody and they start speaking French to you and you don't know French, you can't communicate, right? So when you talk to a web server, you need to speak HTTP to that web server so it can understand your request and give you back the web page that you want. And if you can't speak that language, then you're not going to be able to talk to that service. So I think of the, the layering here, so other, you know, the, um, uh, so people, are people who say networking familiar with the OSI network model? What are the layers in the OSI network model? And so uh, it's nice, 
it's always nice to think of these things and these abstract layers, and we have this OSI model that's whatever, five or seven layers, or however you want to think about it. But, um, but it's important, it's especially important to security to understand that actually these aren't the beautiful, completely abstract layers like we think they are. So ARP, as we'll see at the link layer, ARP actually is used to translate your hardware interface, so your MAC address, to an IP address. So it actually bridges a little gap between those two layers. And then you have crazy things like DNS all the way at the top. What's the point of DNS? Yeah, resolves a domain name to an IP address, right? So that, a domain name is some other concept, so it's kind of, I mean, to resolve that name to back down to an IP address. So there is intermixing kind of between these levels, um, and that's why we need to study the details so we actually understand what the security implications of these things are. Questions on this? So IP addresses. So the idea behind the IP address is, well, what's the uh, what would be a physical analogy for an IP address? Your street address. Your, or your PO box. yes. So your your street address or your PO box. I say that's okay. Yes. So your address. So how can other computers? talk to you. So the IP address basically defines this is my, my IP address. Um, and so each host can have one or more IP addresses. This is an important thing. You can actually have more than one IP address uh, for each, for every network interface. So uh, for instance, when I go to my office and I plug directly into the network, my computer is actually still on Wi-Fi. So I have two different network interface cards, a wired and a wireless. Each of them will have a different IP address when talking to uh, the server. How many, so we're going to focus on IPv4 uh, because the adoption rate of IPv6 is still not anywhere close and you can go learn about that on your own time. Um, so IPv4 is a 32-bit address, which means how many addresses do we have? How many? A lot, but not enough. That's not very precise. Two to the 32. Was it? Two to the 32. Two to the 32, yes. So, which seems like a very large number, right? Uh, but, yeah, as we'll get into, we're actually running out of IPv4 addresses, but it's also not hurting us as bad as we thought it would, so. Um, and the idea is, so most of the time you see an IP address, it's represented in this dotted decimal notation. So what is an IP address? When you really like break it down, what is it? build the 32-bit IP address 
from this data decimal notation. So it's just an important point to kind of um, rethink about, like, this is not an IP address, right? An IP address is not this data decimal thing. This represents what that number, that 32-bit number actually is. Um, so back when IP addresses were first created, they were actually specified as the first seven, so, um, so the, the addresses were actually in terms of class, net ID, and host ID. So the host ID would define you, your system, and remember this IP address is an internet, you know, you know, an internet level IP address. So the class would specify what type, uh, a unique class would specify basically an organization. Um, so organizations would have different classes of IP addresses. So a class, so for instance, like, and why this is interesting, so class A has, um, is basically, I believe it, this, this would be, it all starts, yeah, all starts with zero, and, um, Isn't that the number of bits assigned to the prefix? Yes. So we need to talk about prefixes for this one? Not yet. The class no, because classes, uh, the classes were very fixed, like this system is very fixed. Talk about it in a second, moving away from this system and talking about prefixes. Um, but the important point here is that uh, you, as an organization, would get if you have a class A IP address range, that means you can have actually with commas here 16 million hosts on your network. So that's what this by having this address, and those 16 million hosts are all essentially publicly routable and knowable. And then, so class B, so there, but there's only 128 or 126 of those uh, because some of them are reserved. Hmm. This makes sense. The 10 dot IP address is in this space. So if actually, is anybody on the ASU network? Anybody want to tell me what your IP address is? 10 dot something? Yeah, 10 dot something. So that's actually, uh, there are three address ranges at different classes. Um, the 10 is one. Maybe you know what the other ones are? 172. 172. What's the third one? 192. 192. Yeah, so, um, uh, yes. So those are um, super interesting because, so basically those, those are not publicly routable and are meant for internal usage. So this means that ASU, by using a 10 dot IP address space, has room for 16 million hosts on that internal network. Yes. 192, 168. Yes, I don't remember. Yes, I don't know the exact class how it maps in there, but yes, they're no, small. Class A. Those, are, I think that those two are class A. Correct. Right. The 10 is definitely class A. Yeah. Um, so if you go, there's an RFC, so the, um, uh, I guess I'm sorry about that, but um, so how do these things come to be? How did we get to this point? 32-bit IP address range with these ideas of classes. RFCs. RFC, what's an RFC? Request, request for comments. Request for comments. Where does that come from? Where does that go to? Who's, who are you requesting comments from? It's like the overall governing body of whoever created all this stuff in the first place. It's a bunch of network engineers that basically built this through, I think it was the IBM or Microsoft who kicked this off. And so they, they started IP addressing and then they built this consortium that then takes requests for comments and yes. adds that to the overall group. Yes, I believe it's the Internet Engineering Task Force, is the IETF, and they have a series of <coughs> requests for comments, RFCs, that define standards and protocols. So if you go, you can look up the RFC for IP addresses that describes exactly what these things are. There's an RFC for uh, private IP address ranges. Um, so actually, I was looking at you. Does everyone remember the Mirari, Mirari botnet? Somebody tell us what it was, what it did. Yeah. Uh, it was an IoT botnet that basically was a scan for devices to keep all of these things in Yeah, it was printers, uh, network cameras, and I think there was something else. A third, routers, yeah. And they would look at a list of default username and passwords, would scan the internet looking for these things. Um, 
And it's interesting because I can't remember exactly how, but the source code of the botnet was released. Um, so you can actually go look at that. And I was actually talking to some, I want to say they were high school students or undergrad students who were looking at trying to study and analyze this, this, um, this botnet and that software. But of course, you, you have to tell them you don't want to actually run this because it will start scanning the public internet and you're basically infecting people, right? So you want to run this in a private IP address space range that you actually create. The problem is, is the software actually would look, am I in at 192.168 whatever um, private IP address range and not scan those? Uh, because it only wanted to scan the public internet. But it turns out it actually did it incorrectly. The, well, the number of bits that it looked for was not actually correct. And so you could create a public IP range that was, I'm oh, sorry, you could create an IP uh, local network with an IP range that was private, but they thought it was public, and so they'd actually go and scan it. So uh, it was pretty interesting. But so these things are hard for even malware authors to get right. Um, <laughs> And so the idea here is, should be maybe apparent as you get more and more down and you have, um, you can have more and more networks. So at the class C level network, you can have, what is this, 2 million networks, each with 255 hosts, or 256 hosts. What's the downside here? Well, each one of these networks needs somebody to administer it, right? So definitely these are associated to, um, so we need to know what organization, where, who owns this IP range to know where packets go to. What else? What what of these ranges would ASU be? Let me that one. So let's say ASU got a class A 
network range, even at half a million, even at a million, are we using all of that IP address range? No, which is super wasteful, right? Because there's 15 million IP addresses that are remaining file load and nobody's using, right? Um, so if anybody looks that up, let me know. Class A uh, networks. So the idea was, okay, this class system is much, much, much too coarse grained. So they came up with a new scheme of doing classless interdomain routing. So rather than just have these four classes to know exactly which part of the prefix of the IP address to route to, uh, you could do this without doing that. Um, and so there was also, it was very clear that, okay, because of this, there's a ton of machines that need to be on the network or want to be on the network, and so we want to actually provide IP addresses to them. Um, IPv6 uses how many IP addresses? What was that? 128-bit IP ad uh, addresses, which is huge. I don't, I don't even know how to say it. It's huge. It's a huge number. It's, <laughs> More than, what are some of the phrases to describe it? It's like more than, you could give every grain of sand in on the earth its own IP address, IPv6 address, and you would not run out. Um, so it's a huge, huge uh, address space, but adopted is very slow, yeah. Um, so University of Southern California. Mm. So USC has a class A um, network, awesome. So has IBM and Apple. IBM, Apple, yeah, those are good. Um, We'll talk uh, later about the security implications of having all of your organization's computers publicly accessible from the internet. So that's a whole separate issue, but um, it definitely is a problem. So CIDR is basically, <coughs> so let's look at this. So there's one in my mind, but we can blame you, uh, USC. USC actually has queues in class A. Ah, nice. Stanford? Yeah, all that makes sense. All right, cool. Sweet. All right, so. Yeah, okay, so the idea is, let's say, uh, somebody want to, okay, somebody give me a, I'm gonna need you to have random number generators. Give me a random IP address. system we'd say okay the network ID is the um, first seven bits so it's very fixed you'd say you'd say okay this defines the network that it's going to be in and the rest of the bits define where it goes after that um, and the other one was at what is it 14 bits so you use wherever 14 bits is I don't want to count it um, and the rest is the host. So, but this is very, like we talked about, this is not very granular. So the idea behind CIDR is to s use this net host boundary on any bit between 13 and 27. So you could actually have, oh, 27, so this is, actually we can work around 32. So I think it would be here, is that right? Something like that? So this, whole thing would tell you the network, and this part would tell you the, the host name. And you can actually do this at any level. So if you did, and the way this is usually written is 1.1.1.1 slash, let's say 24. So 24 means, the slash 24 means place the, uh, 
Place the boundary on the 24th bit, which should be here. Right, this, right? Right, so this means the network that I want to talk to is 1.1.1.1.1, and the host that I want to talk to in that network is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.0.
if we guarantee that things are delivered, as we'll see, that actually adds a lot of latency overhead. So some network applications don't need to pay that network latency cost. So they don't need to think about that. Um, what does connection list mean? Besides the obvious. Somebody might not be listening. Who just said it? Well, that's good. Okay. So yeah, one aspect would be there's no guarantee that there's actually somebody there on the other end to listen to it. What else does it mean? There's no reply that you've actually created a connection with the server that you're talking to. Yeah, uh, there's no guarantee that that they'll like. There's no way for them to just send you something back necessarily as part of IP. So, um, and if you get a packet from them or a piece of data from them, you don't actually know is this a reply to the thing that I sent or is it a brand new packet coming back? So that's what connection list means there. There's not a, um, when you're talking to somebody on the phone, you know when you talk to them that they're replying back to your voice, right? Um, it would be like if you called somebody and left a voicemail and then they called you back and left a voicemail on your phone, you don't actually know are they calling you about something new or about the old thing that you originally called them about, right? So it's just, you just see you have a voicemail. So IP datagrams this is important. This is why we talked about IP addresses. And IP datagrams can be exchanged between any two nodes, provided they both have IP addresses. And we'll add on another caveat that they are publicly addressable IP addresses. So this means, so this goes back to the other good analogy is um, mail, the mail system. So if I know your address, I can send you a letter, right? Everybody agree? I mean, I know your address and your name. Like, I think name is optional. Cool. And so for actually, as we talked about, so the link layer, which we'll briefly touch on, has a lot of different protocols of how to actually do this link layer part. But at the IP level, we don't care about that at all. So in our good friend RFC 791, which you can go to and see a diagram exactly like this, we actually break down an IP diagram into its various <coughs> chunks. Um, because the idea is just like a letter, right? Can you just like write a letter to somebody like, dear so-and-so, blah, 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 sincerely Adam, and just throw it in the mailbox? You need to write an address. You need to write an address? What else do you need? Stamp it. You need to pay for it? You need to stamp, stamp to pay for it? What else? Return you need a return address in case anything else goes wrong? What else? Do you need an envelope? Yes. No, it makes a postcard. What makes a postcard different? It is the envelope. So envelopes are optional, right? What What does the envelope provide? Yeah. So it protects whatever is inside. Um, optionally, also, if you're sending a larger object, you wouldn't want just an envelope. You might want like a card or a box. Yeah, you may, well, that's getting a little off analogy, but yes. <laughs> Definitely, you pay more money, and sometimes you're going to ship the object itself. There's actually a great, uh, I should find it, but there's a really cool website of a person who sent a camera, like a disposable camera, through the mail system, and on the back were instructions, like, dear postal worker, like, please take a picture of yourself, like, as you're processing this. So it just had, like, pictures of mail, they would just send it various places, and, like, uh, mail people and people working at postal facilities would take pictures of it of random stuff uh, as it was getting processed. But they like literally put the postage and like the address on the camera itself and like they ship it. So uh, yeah, the post office is pretty cool. Um, so and so just like that. So just like in the case that you can't just throw data at another machine, right? You need to provide metadata about where is it going, who did it come from, um, any other options and flags. So one important thing is what version of the IP protocol are you talking about? So this is actually something that's uh, very important and a good design decision that happens in uh, all types of APIs and protocols is you want a way to know that you are talking IPv4, right? Because if the person on the other side gets your packet, if they don't know if you're talking IPv4, IPv5, IPv6, IPv100, because it's in the future, um, then they don't know how to interpret the rest of the packet, right? So it's actually important to be the first four bits that come across. Um, the length, so the length of the header, how long is the header going to be? Uh, some other flags, service type, uh, total length, 
an identifier, so a packet that actually uniquely identifies this packet. We'll talk about that um, very briefly. Um, flags, so there's various uh, IP level flags that you can set on the packet. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is, um, so unlike the postal system, uh, let's say you can pay more money to have them ship bigger and bigger objects for you, right? Um, different physical links have different restrictions on how big data they can send across their limits. Um, so what, what IP actually provides is a way to, if you try to send a packet, or if you try to send a chunk of information that's, let's say, uh, 500K or I don't know, a huge uh, IP datagram chunk, uh, you can do that, but what it'll do is it'll chop it up into pieces, into fragments, and then send each of those fragments. So it would be like, I guess kind of like a transporter or something, where like the post office would take your large package, chunk it up into different pieces that actually fit, put an identifier on each of them to say these are actually all from the same package, then put the fragment offset that would say this is fragment one, fragment two, fragment three, so that way when it got to its destination by any number of ways, it could be reassembled back into that one thing. Uh, time to live is important. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, the underlying protocol, so there's actually uh, the actual, no, is that right? Uh, protocol, uh, a checksum for the header. So this is actually something very interesting. So uh, it is not a cryptographic hash of the header information, but it is a checksum that verifies that all the rest of the headers were sent kind of correctly. I guess if we should say, since we're doing security, that it uh, verifies that the header checksum matches. So what does a checksum do? Each other and it ended up crashing on them and 
destroyed them and killed their computer. I mean, that actually is what happened. It's, it like destroyed the reassembly process, caused a buffer overflow in the kernel of the other system, and it caused it to crash. So you could just, I think it was like, it was only something like 10 packets. You could just shut down any computer on the internet, um, which is not good. Hopefully you agree. Uh, interesting, uh, another super interesting thing, this is something we're gonna hammer over and over again. The source IP address the attacker can control. So they can put whatever IP, whatever return address they want on that, for that source IP address. Why, I mean, well I guess we'll look at the why later. Um, but it's important to note that you can actually, and we'll definitely have a homework assignment on this, you can create any packets you want. So you don't need to use the operating system to create your packets. You can create your own packets uh, if you have root access, and then you can send them wherever you want them to go. So the, the idea of encapsulation is you have your IP packet, right, which has the IP data that you're trying to send, plus the IP header, and that's encapsulated inside at the frame level. So at the link layer, your ethernet has its own headers, and the data part of the frame is the IP packet, which has its header with its data, and as we'll see, the data part of the IP has first the header of the TCP packet with the actual data. So it's kind of this layering approach um, where you look and there's like header, 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 and then the actual data. So how do packets get around? So the idea is if two networks are in the, if two hosts are in the same physical network, the IP datagram is just encapsulated in the link layer protocol and delivered directly. How does a how does a node know if a node that it wants to talk to is in the same network? Checks the IP address and that's the Yes, it checks the IP address with its the network that it's on. So we looked at CIDR, it says, it, I know what network I'm on, I know the IP address of the machine I want to talk to, is this machine in my same subnet? In that same, so does, basically it checks, does the prefix of our, my network match the prefix of the other systems? Um, so this is done in a couple of different ways. One way is usually, so this would be the subnetwork, so you can use the slash, you know, slash 24, this would be 111.10.20.20. 1 slash 24. So this would say that the subnetwork is 11.10.20. Cool. So you have two machines here. We have the uh, 11, 10, 20, 121, 11, 10, 20, 114. Uh, what are these numbers? Which is what?
server if it's uh, pinged that we would set that IP address exactly? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of a trick question because the point is you just you know you want to talk to this machine, right? <laughs> and the idea is you are this machine, you want to talk to dot 14, uh, 111, 10, 20, 14. You know that. Either it's a website you want to collect information from, however that happens, but that's part of the given. You want to talk to this machine. And so, so what is so what does our 121 host ask first? So it wants to talk to this machine. What does it ask first? What was that?
What's the next piece of information I need to be able to create an Ethernet packet? What else do I know? Let's go look back to that. Do I know my MAC address? Yeah, I know it. It's in my machine. Do I know .14's MAC address? But do you actually specify when you talk to an IP address, do you say, do you type in google.com and then provide the MAC address of the Google server you want to talk to? No. Also, it doesn't matter because it's not on your local network. But the idea is we need some mechanism, some way to map and say, I know I want to talk to 111.10.2014, and I know that that host is on my local network. What is their MAC address? So that is where ARP comes in, because you need a way to basically ask the computers on your local network, what is your MAC address? Or who has, sorry, uh, what's the MAC address of the computer with this IP address? Because you know you have the IP address. Um, so this is the key idea of ARP. So here we have a network where we're at 192.168.1.100. And we want to talk to 1.10 with these different uh, Ethernet addresses. And here we can assume we're in the 192.168.1 network, so it's a slash 24. So if I'm host A, you can actually do, so if you do, you can do this on your computer if you're running Linux. You can do ARP-A, which will show you the list of, of um, MAC address and IP address pairs that it knows about. It's empty right now, so it doesn't show anything. So if we want to ping 192.168.1.10, before we can actually, which is uh, generates an IP packet, before we can do that, our host A actually has to send an Ethernet frame with an ARP request saying, who has 192.168.1.10? And this is captured from uh, a tool called TCP dump, which is looking at uh, traffic. You can go and play with this. You can use TCP dump or Wireshark to be able to sniff and the traffic that's going on. So here we can see that this, the, the thing basically says, ARP, who has 192.168.1.10, tell 192.168.1.100. So this is quite literally this ARP packet here. So this is uh, an ARP type packet that says, hey, who has this? And we can see that the source MAC address is 8046748.3, which is 8046704.83, which is host A's MAC address. But the key problem is we don't know the MAC address that we want to talk to, right? We're sending out an Ethernet frame. We have our source MAC address, but we don't know who the destination is. So by default, the all F, this means to broadcast to every single MAC address. So this goes to the entire subnet. Everyone on the subnet should get this message. Who has this? So if you have 16 million nodes on here, this is going to be a very large broadcast. It's going to go to a lot of nodes. And then when host B, so host B is listening for Mac, uh, ARP traffic, when it gets this request, it responds and says, hey, um, it responds and says, hey, from 0131D98B8, right here, to 8046748.3, so this is destined just for one person, hey, I'm 192.168.1.10, and I'm at 0131D98B8. Then the ping actually happens, where you see the ICMP echo messages. And if we run the ARP-A, we can see that on host A, that it has 192.168.1.10 is at this address. So this actually does cache. Uh, as we talked about, it will, it will cache this for a while. And the interesting thing is host B also sees this. So host B, if you run ARP-A on there, you see that now host B knows about host A and has the mapping between. Because when it got this ARP request, this contains all the information so they know this mapping. Cool. So this is really important to understand this because this bridges the gap between IP addresses and local MAC addresses.